This speaker is Seduce uh, Savaraj, Sund uh, Sadu uh, Sa Savaraj, and uh, he uh, walks with the Lord. Um, he sees him probably at least once a day. Lord shows up and uh, physically. And not only that, he does uh, sit on the council of Abraham, which is in heaven. There's 24 elders, which makes the this decisions for uh, all sorts of things around the earth. Um, he is a living, breathing man that sits with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Enoch, Paul, Jeremiah, and so on. The council of Abraham is the who's who of the Bible, Job, and so on and so forth. They're elders, and this man sits there. So he gets the chance to, to be a part and here, I, I don't know if he gets the chance to make the decisions like they do, but he gets, he sits in there and he hears the decisions that are made uh, by the Council of Abraham, which um, a lot of them are approved by the Lord, because it has to go through the Lord first to be approved. And so, you know, if we're going to learn, uh, the best way to learn is to learn from someone who sits right there well, in the decision-making process. He's been to the Most High God a couple of times. You know, and um, the Lord Jesus Christ took him there. It's, re it's pretty frightening because um, to go before the Most High God, at least when he did, because the Most High God's voice was thunder. Can you imagine someone talking to you in a thundery voice like thundering and, and lightning? Yeah, he sat through that and he was there. Of course, he was <laughs> scared to death. But, um, and he gets translated all over the place, uh, all over the world to do different things for God. And caught up in the spirit a lot. Visions like you would not believe. He shares thousands and thousands of experiences. He's been walking with the Lord for about 40 years. And um, he's got the largest TV network, Christian TV network in the world. It's uh, based in India. And uh, it's bigger than anyone uh, else's in the United States or anywhere else's. It's huge. It's called Angel, Angel TV. You can find them on the World Wide Web and also on um, YouTube. And uh, so it's time to learn. It's time to press in and learn, really, really learn and get ready for these end times last days. We End times started 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ um, set foot on earth. Now, the last days are now. This, these are the last days of the end times. So he's going to teach us how to trust and believe in God and give us an idea of what to expect. And it's a lot. Tribulation, uh, rapture. Cashless society, new world order, false prophet, one world religion, one world government, and so on. And uh, he teaches us all about all these things. So enjoy, keep learning, listen to something every single day. You got to get up to speed because we are remnant. We're the chosen, we're the, we are the elect. And it's time for us to step up to the place so we can be strong towers for ourselves, make the right decisions, families, and churches. And believe me, you want to know a lot of the things that he's going to say, because you're going to need to be strong in order to make the right decisions, because there's going to be some um, hefty decisions to make in the future. Oh, by the way, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Do that now. And give a thumbs up, uh, a like, so other people on around the world can get this valuable informa information. We are the elect. Of a kingly priest of the order of the Melchizedek. Every priest has a responsibility. If you read the book of Leviticus and the book of Exodus, when God gave the plan for the priesthood, he gave them responsibilities. Even the attire that the high priest wears, the high priest as well as the sons, the priest, normal priest attire, even all those attire were dictated by God. They cannot just simply wear any dress they like. These are the prescribed way of dressing. Not only the prescribed way of dressing, even the color was chosen by God. This is how you should be dressed when you come before my presence. Not you just come before God's presence like you're going to a beach party. You wear super short skirts, super short pants, and then sleeveless, allless, you know. In today's modern charismatic church, 
the reverence for God is totally eroded. To meet a mortal man, you will be very punctual. Nobody skips an appointment. Very punctual we come. But to meet God, you take your own sweet time to come. 10 o'clock church service. People take their own sweet time to walk slowly. What's the rally? They are still worshipping. We'll go late. See, you're not coming. Now listen, you're not coming to mark attendance in the church. You're not coming to show your face to your pastor. Okay, yes sir. You put your fingerprint at the church in front, attendant mark. No, you are coming to present yourselves to God. So if you are coming to present yourselves before God, you must be punctual. We should wait for God, not God wait for us. And then this other incident in India where we organize a youth camp meeting every year in January up in the Himalayan mountains. And again, the same scenario. The first meeting supposed to start at 9 o'clock. And you know, you know, the musicians and the audio video technicians, they always have a different spirit. And the spirit is never start on time spirit. <laughs> so, you know, even though the cameras are all well and good, the camera will come, they'll try to tune this here, tune that. And the musicians, what are the musicians? Every time a guitarist will take ping, 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 ping. <laughs> and then they'll take out the mic. They'll always have to say one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Nobody ever says five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> always the same formula all over the world. Mic testing, one, two, three. Mic testing. Why not say A, B, C, D? <laughs> you know, always the standard formula. And I always get tired of this, you know. So they... That particular day, instead of starting at 9, it started at 9.45. And I was so mad, I scolded everybody. And they gave all kinds of excuses. Genuine excuse. Oh, this late, that late, this cable not there, that cable not here, this echo not working, that echo not working. So anyway, okay, forgiven for the first day. Second day, same thing happened. Now, what excuse they could give on the second day? Overslept. Too cold in the winter. <laughs> okay. Third day, something happened. Or either this happened on the first year or the second year. I cannot remember. What happened was, I was scheduled to speak in the first session. So, I told my secretary, I will always be there on time. So I went, since I knew these guys are going to set up late, so I went late. So instead of 9 o'clock, I came at 9.30. And uh, all the kids were already all seated because they have no choice, compulsory. If they are not seated by 9 o'clock, then all out. So youth meeting, ma, easy to control, you know. <laughs> anyway, when I came into the front row, where all the preachers always sit. I saw the Lord Jesus seated on the front row. And I was taken aback when I saw him seated there. So I asked him, Lord, what are you doing here? <laughs> As if he's not entitled to come. <laughs> actually, what I actually meant was, I, it was a slip of tongue that day, you know. What I meant actually to say was, Lord, how come you came so early? <laughs> Because we didn't make the opening prayer. See, if you observe opening prayers that people do, they say, Lord, we welcome you. So once they say that, only then the Lord is allowed to come. <laughs> so that's what actually I meant, you know. But in the slip of tongue is, how come you are here? So the Lord understood what I actually was trying to say. He told me, listen, he said, didn't you advertise that the meeting begins at 9. So I have come. No, that statement went deep into my heart like an arrow. And I knelt down there and I repented before God. Here we set a time, 9 o'clock. And the Lord came at 9 o'clock. Because my children are all going together at 9. 
and here I came late. That day I repented, and from that day till today, twenty years have passed by. I I then told all our team, even if there's only one person, we begin our meeting on time. I don't care who's there. Even if there's nobody, we announce the meeting at nine. We announce the meeting at two. We begin at that scheduled time because the Lord will be there. The angels of God will be there. So we punctual. You know, this is the spirit of reverence that we must learn now to have that reverential attitude, the reverential fear of God, to fear God. You're not coming, listen again, you're not coming before a man. You're not coming to attend an ordinary Sunday church service. You're coming to meet with God. And God is waiting to teach you of His ways. That's the purpose of church gathering. That's the purpose. So if you, if you set your heart right, then you will get more than what you really come for. You don't even need to come to the front to get a word or get a prayer blessing. Where you are, the Lord will touch you. Just like what happened yesterday. So, reverential fear of God. A criteria for the priesthood. If we don't have the reverential fear of God, we will disqualify. So, what are the responsibilities of a kingly priest of the order of the Melchizedek? Please turn your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and the verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So what is the chief responsibility of the Melchizedek priesthood? Is what you see in the last sentence, the last phrase of the scripture. To serve the living God. That is your number one calling. The number one purpose. The number one duty. The number one mandate. To serve the living God. The primary responsibility of a priest under the Old Testament is to minister unto God. That is their first calling. Not so much to serve men. That is secondary, number two. But their number one primary calling is to first minister unto God. The, the word minister unto God is mentioned 12 times in the Bible. Exodus chapter 28, verse 1, verse 3 and 4, verse 41, chapter 29, verse 1, chapter 30, verse 30, chapter 40, verse 13 and 15, Jeremiah 33, verse 22, Ezekiel 43, 19, 44, 15, and 16. Twelve times, minister unto God is mentioned. So, the primary responsibility of the Melchizedek order kingly priest is to minister unto God by waiting in his sanctuary to inquire in his holy temple Concerning the judgments of God. It is beyond just ministering unto God. See, there are two now. You are not just a priest. You are a kingly priest. So, if you are a priest, you just offer sacrifices. You just minister. That's one part. Now you have an additional role. Kingly priest. So, the kingly responsibility is you come into the holy temple. You sit there, wait upon God to hear what he will speak to you, to inquire of him of his judgments, to inquire of him of his ways. Then you teach to other people the ways of God, the righteous judgments of God. You don't make your own judgment. That is after sight. 
you make your judgments inquiring from God. Lord, what is this? What is the, the true things that takes place? What your eyes see is not what really took place. What your ears heard is not what really took place. Let me give you one example. In the 50s, the wonderful man of God called Kenneth again, he was ministering in a church. And uh, in the church, there were five wonderful praying grandmas. Every church has this, you know. They have either women or grandmas. And they are the pillars. They are the praying warriors who hold, just like these two pillars, they really hold the church up. You know, every church has this. And these grandmas are not only prayer warriors, they are also prophesizers. They always come to the pastor, I heard a word for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they always used by God in for prophecy, or the pastor always rely on them because they are the pillars. So in that particular church, there were these five grandmas. So during a, a period of uh, a revival meeting in the church, one day, the awesome glory of God came down in the church and one new believer in the church was seated right at the back, stood up and gave a powerful word of prophecy. And the pastor discerned it to be a true word of God and Brother Hagin discerned it to be a true word of God. After the meeting, but strangely, all these grandmas were sitting in the VIP seat. They were unmoved. So, Brother Hagin, who has been to this church many times, knows these grandmas by name. So, he was wondering how come these grandmas were not used in prophecy. And they were just sitting like lockwood, not moving, you know. So, anyway, maybe they were, you know, sometimes people have off days. <laughs> Don't you? Don't laugh, la. you also have off day, right? You, you have your off days. So I thought, okay, maybe it's your off day today. They switch off. And uh, after the meeting was over, then the pastor took him to the pastor's office for a cup of tea. And he inquired this pastor concerning that man. He said, oh, he's a very new believer, but zealous for the Lord. And then, uh, okay, nothing much. Period. Finish. So after that, Brother Hagin was driving. Let's say, for example, this is the church. From here, he was driving his car to the hotel. As he was driving, he saw this man, this young man, walking on the road. And in that town, there's one particular street that is populated by prostitutes, just like this area. So the whole street is from the beginning to the end, red light area. And... Uh, this man turned into that street and began to walk down the street. And Brother Hagin saw that and he was shocked. How can this man walk down this lane of prostitutes? Because there's no hotel there. There's no other homes there. Nobody lives there except left row, right row, all prostitutes. And he was shocked. How can this man is going down there? And he saw that and he drove. So he drove, he came to his hotel room. He was so troubled by that. How can this man? He gave a powerful word of prophecy. And yet, a few minutes later, he's going to the prostitutes. How can he be? How can he be possible? So he was so troubled by that, he couldn't even sleep. He was tossing on the bed, on the left, on the right. And he was just being troubled by this question. So he decided to solve the problem. He got up from the bed, he knelt down, and he prayed. He said, Lord, I need an answer now. How can you use this man who is fre frequenting prostitutes but at the same time you came upon him and your spirit used him? How is it possible? Because a fountain either will give out good water or bad water. Am I right? You cannot have 50-50, right? One portion of the water you taste and see is so sweet. The other side you or salty water. Is it possible? Not possible, right? So as he was so troubled by that. And the Lord came to him. Asking him, what is your problem? What is your problem? So he told the Lord all the problem. 
So the Lord told him, look, you, what did you actually see? The Lord asked him. He said, I saw this man walking down this lane. Do you know what happened after that? You saw him walking down the lane. But do you know what happened after that? So the Lord then told him what happened after that, which Hagin did not see. The Lord told him, let me tell you about his life. This son of mine was a womanizer. That was his whole life. He was not only womanizing, he used to frequent prostitutes almost every day of his life. And that particular street is the place where he frequents every day. When he gave his life to me, he made a complete break. But that day, but every now and then, he falls to the temptation. Because that was his lifestyle. And without him realizing that day, he walked down that street. But when he realized where he was, which you did not see, he stopped where he was, he knelt down and he cried to me for strength. Your eyes did not see all that. I strengthened him to overcome, he turned back and he went back to his own home. Your eyes did not see all this, but you were quick to judge him. And then the Lord said, by the way, let me tell you about something about those grandmas. <laughs> uh, you have such an exalted opinion about the grandmas. Let me tell you something about them. They have been living a life of disobedience for the last 30 years. See, nobody knows that. And the Lord said, I told them to do something and till today they have not done it. So that is the reason why my spirit did not come upon them and it came upon that man. You see how we see and God sees? So a true priest inquires in the temple of God and judges righteously. That should be the attitude of the Melchizedek priesthood. So the primary responsibility of the Melchizedek order kingly priest is to minister unto God by waiting in his sanctuary and to inquire in his holy temple for the judgments of God. When did Abraham got blessings from Melchizedek? Now when did he got, got it? Genesis chapter 14 verses 1 to 16 says after he fought wars with five kings and overcame them. After the victory, when he was coming back, then he met with Melchizedek. Now, if you, if you study about the five kings, you'll find something very interesting about the five kings, which is a key to the blessings that Abraham received from Melchizedek. Now, what is the common denominator about the five kings? The five kings represents or signifies rebellion. The five kings. The five kings are Sodom, Gomorrah and the other three related cities of the, of the same attitude. In the past, for 12 long years, they were faithfully paying tribute to the other five kings. Then they decided to repel. No, we will no more pay tribute to you. We will not do this. We will not be subservient to you. We declare independence. That's when these other five kings went to war with these five kings. So the attitude of rebellion, the attitude of stubbornness, the attitude of arrogance, the attitude of pride, the attitude of haughtiness, five kings. You must kill these five kings. When you kill these five kings, then you have overcome. You have overcome to receive this Melchizedek anointing and the blessing. So what does this, what does this tell us? Number one. Reign over yourself. 
reign over yourself. The self is the greatest enemy you can ever find anywhere. Even worse than Satan. Yourself. You know why it's worse than Satan? Because Satan is Satan. Okay? Already gone for good. But you redeemed but self still alive. You are redeemed, sanctified, but yourself, the I is still there. So that makes you worse than Satan. Am I right? The self. You must reign over the self. Overcome the self. Your body is the temple of God. And you are the priest. But as king, you must reign over that self. Your spirit man must exercise the kingly authority to subjugate yourself. Unless and until yourself dies, you will not become an overcomer. Unless and until yourself dies, yourself is crucified. In any given situation, the self will trip you down. The self will cause you to fall. You look at the life of Samson. He was mightily anointed by the Holy Spirit. Of the seven spirits of God, he had the Spirit of the Lord upon him. But he had a weakness in his life. The lust of the flesh. That was his weakness. And though he was mightily anointed, he did great exploits. Every now and then, he will trip and fall. Right? Now, what caused the tripping is the weakness of his flesh. He tripped and he fell. He tripped and he fell. He tripped and he fell. Finally, he came to a time. You know, let me tell you one thing, okay? Now, let's suppose uh, the, the wonderful gift of grace stretches from this end to that end. So you start your journey here. You trip, you fall, God's grace reach. Trip and you fall, you trip and you fall. Sooner or later, you will come to this end. When you come here, you trip, you fall. You are out. You are out. You are no more within that protective covering anymore. This is what happened to Samson. From the beginning till he met Delilah. You know how many women, lustful women he met with, he slept with. But each time, the grace of God was there. And God used his mother and father to correct him. But he wouldn't listen to anybody. Until he came to this place. Even then, even when he was flirting with Delilah, the, he was still within that grace. When he stepped over, you know, when he despised his anointing. <clears throat> that was when he stepped over. When he counted the costly grace of God as nothing. Like Esau. For one bowl of prawn noodles. <laughs> or fish ball noodles. For, for one bowl. He said, okay, I don't value my birthright. Which was to say, I don't care about my anointing. I want this flesh. That's what Samson told Delilah. I don't care about my anointing. I want you. So he was willing to treat the anointing. He didn't realize he was already at the age. He thought he was still long time. He was already at the age. The moment he spoke, Okay, this is it. He fell. The spirit of the Lord left him. Same thing happened to King Saul. The same thing happened to Judas. And the same thing, okay, now we'll come to the, okay, you may say, you may argue with me, oh, but all these are the Old Testament. But now under the New Covenant, we have the blood that extends forever. I agree with you 100%. But if you read the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul says, Demas, who was my associate, left me for the love of the world and went back to the world. Right? Demas
Demas is one of Paul's right hand assistant. But the love of the world came inside him and he left. He left the grace of God. So it's possible to fall away. Don't be deceived by some deceptive doctrines of demons that say, once safe, forever safe. Or demonic doctrines that say, you know, the Jesus already died for you on the cross. No matter what you do, no matter how you live, you're always safe. That's the latest doctrine of demon that teaches that. The grace covers you abundantly. We all live by grace, right? But that does not mean we despise the grace of God. So, we need to walk in reverential fear. You must overcome the self. You must overcome. Why you must overcome? Luke chapter 17 verse 21 says, The kingdom of God is within you. It is within you. Because the kingdom of God is within you, Romans chapter 6 verse 13 says, You must now allow the kingdom of God to have dominion over each organ of your body. Every organ in your body. Like the 31 kings in Canaan land. You must overcome them, fight them and bring them all under subjection so that Jerusalem or rather Mount Zion can become the capital in your life. And when Mount Zion becomes the capital, King Jesus will rule and reign in the Mount Zion of your life. Romans chapter 6 verse 12 and 14 says, Sin must no longer reign in our body. It must not. But it's still like there. You feel that. The reason is because you don't kill the kings. You just pamper the king. You know, we just pamper the king, say, don't worry, king. I know you are there. But what to do? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we think, you see, we misquote another scripture to, as excuse for our weaknesses. Each time we trip, after, my spirit is willing. But what to do? My flesh is so weak. No, you cannot always, baby Christians can say that. But not a matured believer. When you meditate, okay, how to overcome this self? There's only one way. No other way. This is the only way. When you meditate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and apply that death to the area of your life, you will become dead in Christ to the world. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 tells us that. The only, that's the only way. Death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Once you meditate that, you meditate and you meditate, you meditate until that becomes inside you. Then you are dead with Christ in Christ. Then all the scriptures that say we are dead with Christ will become very meaningful, very practically real in your life. So meditate on the death of the Lord Jesus. What the Lord Jesus died physically is you dying to your flesh. And your victory or your power that you can draw from Christ Jesus for you to die is by meditating on his death. When you meditate on the death, then you're drawing that anointing to crucify your flesh, to crucify yourself so that you can die. That's the only way. No other way. Don't waste your time fasting and praying. I show you a shortcut. Shortcut is meditate. But worldly shortcuts means you go this way, you can reach a point quickly. But this will not take place overnight. Because there are already 31 layers inside you. Like onion, you know, you keep peel on, peel, 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 peel until nothing exists. You must become like that. L 
you must become olam, vanish. You don't exist anymore. That should be your goal. The I in you. Today, you have heard it is possible. Today, I have given you the sort of the spirit. And I have given you secrets of the five wounds of Jesus. You meditate that, that is your success. You know, if you look at the cross in one way, it looks like a sword with a handle on the top and a long, long pole, right? That is your sword. Take that sword and strike at all the 31 kings in your life. Amen. When the process of death is completed, then the spirit will quicken life in you to reign as kings because you have overcome. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. The spirit of Christ will quicken you only when you die. If you don't die, he will not quicken you. The Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead only after he died. Right? Not before that. So even the son of man has to completely die before the spirit of life can come upon him and raise him up back to life. That's the same process that will take place inside you. When you truly die, then the spirit will quicken you and you will rise up. That spirit man in you will rise up, resurrected. And you will begin to be the kingly priest. You will walk in that dominion and the authority like how Adam had walked. Meant to walk. It will be yours. You are a priest to minister unto God in worship and love for God. Now this is responsibility number two. What is your number two responsibility? You are a priest to minister unto God in worship and love for God. Not just worship. As a priest, you are to call upon the name of God. This is the most important responsibility. You must receive a revelation of the name of God. The Lord Jesus said, in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. I have revealed your name to them. What name did he reveal to them? The name that the Lord revealed to them. You can get the same revelation. The name of God. Revealed to you. A personal name. You know if you read the Revelation chapter 2 and 3. To one of the churches, the Lord said, I will give you a new stone. New stone has three things written there. One, your new name. Your new name written there. Number two, the name of your God. And number three, name of the city of God. The three things are there. Okay, don't worry too much about your name. Because if not now, tomorrow you will find that out. But the most important is to find out the name of God. What is the name of God? And you call upon that name of God. It is very powerful to call upon the name of God. So far in the Bible, there are five characters or five men of God who call upon the name of God. Genesis chapter 4 verse 26, Seth was the first person to call upon the name of God. Genesis chapter 12 verse 8. Abraham called upon the name of God. Genesis 26 verse 25. Isaac called upon the name of God. Genesis 28 verse 18 and 19. Chapter 31 verse 13. Jacob called upon the name of God. Psalms 99 verse 6. Samuel called upon the name of God. Five characters from the Old Testament. Now I show you something new. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Now who are this day? 
this day are you. So you are the sixth person in this category to whom God will reveal the name. And you are to call upon God in that name. You see, there are three things mentioned in the scripture. Number one, God will restore a pure language. So a pure, the pure language of heaven, you will learn it. Number two, with the pure language that you call upon God, then you will know the name of God. Now let me ask you one question. When God met Adam and Eve, the Bible says every day God came and met with them. Right? He not only met with them, he also talked with them. With what language did God talk with them? Years ago, you know, when uh, I'll give you a clue, okay? Since you all are staring at my face. <laughs> Years ago, I think in 1984, I met a very saintly senior man of God, a sadhu, another sadhu. And he has a great reputation, really a saint. So I met him and we were sitting down talking. And after all the small talks, he looked at me and he asked me, little brother, does God talk with you? I very humbly, you know, he's a great man. How to say, yes, of course. Sir. So I meekfully say, yes. So then he asked me a second question. In what language does God talk with you? So I looked at him. I said, no, sometimes in English, sometimes in the Tamil language. As soon as I said that, he burst into a laughter. Oh, 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 oh. Until the whole room was reverberating with this great roar of laughter. I thought to myself, what? mistake that I made is true, no? English, sometimes Tamil, either one. <laughs> Nothing wrong. I, I didn't answer the question wrongly. After his laughter died down, he looked at me and he said, oh, please don't feel insulted that I looked down on you. He said, God does not talk in English or Tamil or any other languages. He talks in his own language. The Holy Spirit interprets the language of God in a language that you understand. See, he, the scripture says pure language. But what language is pure language? Huh? God language. So, which means language of heaven. Right? So, the language of heaven will now be given to the last day's generation. Amen. Amen. That is the language the Melchizedek priesthood is going to use. To call upon God for temple services, for temple worship, you will be taught that language. It's a different language. I have heard that in heaven, you know. I've even seen the writings in heaven. But it's so different. It looks like something quite similar to ancient Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew is like line, line, have you seen ancient Hebrew? No. So that's another good reason all of you should come to our conference in Israel this June. Then I will take you to the museum and show you this ancient Hebrew writing dating back to 5,000 years. See, when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he wrote with his finger, right? So that it was in a language that he wrote ancient Hebrew, but not exactly like that. So there is a writing in heaven, the pure language that will be taught to the children of, not the children, the kingly, priestly, Melchizedek order priests. That's why God sent the apostle, the Saint Paul today with that scroll in his hand. That scroll has that revelation, that revelation of the Melchizedek, the fuller revelation what I receive, I will not say is complete. Just a little bit. And there's more. When you keep on meditating what I have shared with you, God will give you more revelation. You can receive greater than what I receive. Because what I share, you, you use it as a foundation. And you can step on it and go one step higher. Then 
you will get more and more. See, the revelations of God are not limited to just one person. There are multiple levels of revelations that God can give you understanding. Amen. So the last days prophetic generation are the ones that are mentioned in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. And when you call upon the name of God, what is it that you are actually calling upon? You are not just calling upon the name of God. You are proclaiming the king's rule to establish the king's reign in a place. You are proclaiming the king's rule to be established. The king, to establish the king's reign in a particular place. What do I mean by that? If you read Genesis chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. Now let's look at the scripture. 18. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put on his head, set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of the city had been loose previously. And then in chapter 31 verse 13. Now in, in 18 and 19. Jacob had an encounter with God. In that un encounter. He receives a revelation of God. In fact he received a revelation of the name of God. And when he set up the stone pillar, he called that place Bethel. He proclaimed the name of God. As a result, the reign of God came upon that place. Now you look at 31.13. Again, in that very same place, Jacob has an encounter with God. Now God speaks to him. I am the God of Bethel. Where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. So look at the first part. The place where you anointed the pillar, the place where you proclaim my name. I am that God. I am the God of Bethel. So when you proclaim the name of God, you are proclaiming the reign, the rule, the kingdom rule of God to come. And possess that place. So can you imagine. If a large number of Christians. In this country. Gather together in one place. You all lift up the hands of God. And you proclaim the name of God in your city. What are you doing? You are bringing the kingdom of God rule. To that city. Amen. Not just simply. Gathering together for worship, praise. No. See, all these are babyhood Christianity. You know, you don't always do that. That is part of it. You must progress from there. Enter into the holy place. Don't just always stay in the outer court. To do this activity, that activity. See, in the outer court, there is what? Furniture number one. Don't know, ma. Brazen altar. Furniture number two. Worship basin, right? Okay. You know, 99% of all our Christian activity is only there. You're always repenting of your sins. You're always repenting, always following, falling down. Or number three, always asking for things. And then if you progress a little bit, you come to the labor washing. What it is? You play in the water. <laughs> okay, playing in the water Children like to play in the water, right? Now what is it? Worship That's what the level of water represents Worship, praise and worship So most of all of activity is only here You don't progress from here into the holy place See? Then there is another small group who progress they come to the holy place. When you enter the holy place, on the left hand side, there is this lampstand. And the lampstand is popularly thought saying, it's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you're standing here, always speaking in tongues. You're jumping up and down, saying that I'm Holy Ghost filled. 
goose bum, mosquito bum, all the bumps come. Always jumping up and down. <laughs> but I tell you one thing, okay? I don't mean to insult anybody. The baptism of the Holy Spirit revelation from the lampstand is the most basic understanding of the lampstand. That's the most basic. Not even kindergarten, preschool, below, below that. <laughs> what? Child care. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Below. Uh, inf- uh, thank you. Thank you for that word. Infant care. That's right. Thank you. Infant care. That's, that's, but there's more. You see, why there are 11, 7 branches there? Why? See, you, you only stand there, infant care. Thank you. I will not forget that. In my next book, I will mention that. Infant care. You only there, base, at the base, infant care. Why is the lampstand made of one solid gold? Then the center shaft. From the center shaft, three branches on the right, three branches on the left. Why? See, each one has a powerful walk with the Holy Spirit. Deeper truth. And then, that's where you stay. But, you know what is the heart desire of God? You even bypass this holy place, come into the most holy place. Where there is the throne of God. The Ark of the Covenant. There, you cease from all your activities. You don't make, you are no more repenting, crying, no more playing in the water, no more jumping with goosebumps, finish all that and no no more just always eating bread. (laughs) Bypass all that, you come and stand before God. And you, you say to God, Lord, look into my heart. You know, I tell you one secret. This is how God revealed to me. When you reach that stage, your heart will be like the naked body of Adam. Adam before God. Adam was naked, right? Right? That's what the Bible says, no? Your heart and your mind, that is your goal. To make your mind and heart naked before God. Nothing hidden between you and God. That means when he looks at you, he can see all, your whole heart, your whole mind. No secrets between you and God. When you reach that level, what is in the ark? The Shekinah glory of God. Right? Moses saw the glory of God and God spoke with him from between the cherubim. That would be your privilege. You see the glory of God. You hear God's voice talking to you. No more second-hand news. You know what is second-hand news? What? No more second and is coming to somebody else. God talks to you directly. Amen. See, that is the desire of God. So he's waiting for you there. But what do you do? All is playing games here. Yeah, playing with the water. No. Infant. Subscribe to the channel and keep on learning, guys. Keep learning. Keep learning. God bless you guys forever and ever in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and subscribe. Give a thumbs up, too, so other people around the world can hear this. We are the remnant. We are the elect. We are the chosen ones.